Excellent. I'm Cathy Newman. I normally present Channel 4 News. It's great to have a day off to do something different today. Um, great to see so many people here. And whether you're an architect, a building contractor, a subcontractor, a materials supplier, a local authority, a consultant, a student, have I missed anybody out there? Good. Um, there'll be something for everybody today, I'm told. So tens of thousands of people come to EcoBuild uh, to learn about new products, industry trends, and changes. Now, obviously, EcoBuild suggests uh, the whole thing is about sustainable building. But as you might be aware, government cuts to green subsidies have forced a bit of a change of focus, um, necessity being the mother of invention and all that. So the flavor this year is very much about innovation. And what I find quite striking, having done this a few times now, is that governments come and go, coalitions get formed and then disappear. But some of the questions that I've been asking over quite a few years um, have remained unanswered. So I'm hoping that we might get a little bit closer to answering some of those questions this time. Um, top of my list is how we address uh, the massive housing shortfall. I'm sure that everybody here is familiar with the figures. Um, we need 240,000 new homes a year, and we're just nowhere near that. Now, I know that I and my colleagues in the media quite often overuse the word crisis, but I think when the median house price is 12 times the median income, when you've got people sleeping in garden sheds or other equally cramped accommodation, I think we're quite justified in using that word crisis to describe the housing situation. So how, do, how does the country produce enough houses and how do you produce affordable houses? And above all, how do we do all that sustainably? So we've got three days at EcoBuild, three themes. Today is about homes, tomorrow architecture, and day three, the next generation. So this session uh, is all about what makes good housing. Design and quality, are we losing it? Is high quality housing directly proportionate to cost? And what are the most valued aspects of new build. So I'd like to introduce Tony Pidgeley, who's one of the most respected businessmen in, in the housing industry, who's chairman of the Barclay Group. David Sheridan, who's chief executive of Keepmote, and Rowan Moore, who's architecture critic of The Observer and author of Why We Build. And I notice I've got them in slightly the wrong order on the stage. So Rowan, David, Rowan, Tony, David there. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna ask each of them to come up and do just a few minutes um, to set the scene. And then I'd like to open out to questions from you guys as soon as possible. Don't worry, I've got a few up my sleeve if um, you suddenly decide that you've gone camera shy. But I do urge you to ask as many questions as possible because that's why you're here. So let me ask, first of all, Tony Pidgeley to come up and uh, say a few words. Thank you. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I agree entirely. We have a housing crisis. How are we going to address affordability? But more important, how are the politicians going to address additionality? Where are we going to get these extra homes from? But what makes good housing? I think we start as a group, and I'm going to share what we do, four basic principles. Housing is first and foremost about people. Always remember that every house is somebody's home. You have to put people first, then work on the streets and architecture. Second is about creating a community, a place with an identity, where people like to feel they belong. You need a vision for this community, but then it's got to be affordable. Then comes the landscape, the space between the buildings. These are simple challenges if you stick to them, and we've stuck to them over the years. Elegant architecture, good architecture, you can debate it all, right, at the end of the day. But public realm makes places, it makes people feel socially acceptable, and above all, safe. And above that, we have to have a passion for development. You have to touch the detail. You have to re have a respect for people, and that's where we start every time. But I think the big challenge for this conference is, how do we get to that affordability? How do we get to the additionality? You know, we're always looking at housing. We're always looking at new designs. We're always looking at new modern methods of construction. Now, you take the new London design guides. 
Well, we are entering a bit of correction in the market, so it causes the developers like us, and I'm happy to stand here and debate it, to look at it. You know, and we've looked at this. I mean, if you're buying a one-bedroom flat or a two-bedroom flat, do you need two balconies? They're nice to have. But when a balcony costs you £10,000, you don't need it. You want a home first and foremost. Do you need minimum sizes? You know, what's wrong? I mean, I've been in the business 50 years. When I first started, you had a nine-foot lounge. What's wrong with the 11-foot lounge at the end of the day? It's about having a home. What's wrong with a nine-foot bedroom? Yes, let's have the discussion because that additionality, and we've just looked at the London design guides. We took a, an ordinary a tower block of ours, 16 storeys, drop into 12 storeys, drop into 10 storeys, and we had a long look at the design guides, dropped back to the dimensions we get, and it gave us a 200 unit block, gave us 300 units. That's 50% talking about it in the round. That then gives us additionality. We haven't changed the bulk and massing, we haven't changed the architecture, but it, what it gives us more than anything, it gives us affordability. And I think some of the developers, have to, including myself, have to stand up and be counted for that. But I hope that's the basis that we can have a good debate today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tony. And very succinct as well. You addressed a lot of issues very, very quickly. Uh, David, now. Thanks, Tony. Um, what makes good housing? It, to me, it's very simple. It's where people want to live. Um, most of our stock that we build is outside of London, outside the southeast. But the challenge we face are the same. Um, the challenge on spatial standards, the challenge on planning, how we get to where we want to be, the availability of labour to build the homes that people need. Again, that's a challenge. Affordability and viability is also a challenge. People always want more. But as Tony says, do you need two balconies or do you need a home where people want to live? Now, it's quite strange, as you, you know, having the debate upstairs in the, in, in the room, the anti-room upstairs. The challenges in London are totally different to the challenges outside the, the, the London boundaries, and there is a world outside that, and people need to realise that. So, investment in infrastructure is as keen as developing the homes. You know, if people don't have jobs, if people don't have the transport to get to their jobs, then there's no point building houses where people don't want to live. So, it's a real challenge about creating the homes where people want to live, the challenge with architecture and design, the challenge with planning, but the biggest challenge for me is leadership. Currently, you've got the debate, you know, Bob Kerslake on the radio announcing the devolve more power to local authorities to self-deliver. You've got the overlay of the GLA or the city region boards, which are there, and then you've got government policy. So as a developer, we're trying to juggle an awful lot of bureaucracy being thrown upon us, and it seems to be it's our problem once that problem is thrown upon us to say, we'll sort it out and start developing. So it's a real challenge, so we need clear leadership. I think certainly in the southeast, as our business moves towards the southeast, we need some intervention about making affordability genuine affordable. You know, when the GLA is demanding true valuation for land, you're not going to build affordable homes for the people of London. And that's the truth of it. And until we ch accept that challenge, the challenge of the leadership from the government to make homes affordable is going to be a key challenge. But what makes a good housing is a home where people want to live. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear at the back? I'm very aware that there's a lot of background noise. Yep, no one's having a problem. Okay, brilliant. Rowan, thank you. Okay, well, we're here to talk about quality rather than quantity, but I'd say the two are, are linked. Um, I've just written a book, uh, Slow Burn City, coming out this week about London specifically. Um, and something that comes across uh, that, I, that I sort of found through writing the book and which I, I try and express in the book is that the pressure on space um, of just sheer numbers starts to eat away at the, um, the things that make a city good, that make it worth living in. It skews people's judgments on wh where they want to live, what sort of lives they want to live, whether to have children. Um, they have to make very tough decisions of their work against where they live and so on. And it starts squeezing the quality of the places that are built because people will basically buy anything uh, as long as it gives them a, a, a sort of foothold. Um, and increasingly, planners will give approval to anything because they're trying to meet these impossible to achieve housing numbers. Um, you know, Boris keeps setting figures for how many. Uh, thousands, tens of thousands of homes London needs, which also reflects the, the national figure. 
uh, and year after year we get nowhere near it. Um, in the 20th century, there were two effective ways of dealing with housing demand um, in Britain generally and in London. Between the wars, it was essentially expanding sideways, suburbia, semi-detached, essentially market-led. Um, people didn't like it because of the amount of green space it consumed, but it, it did its job of making a lot of, building a lot of homes at accessible prices. And the other way was, was council-led, um, council housing, uh, especially after the war. The first option was closed down by the invention of the Green Belt. The second option was closed down by Margaret Thatcher's government. And they both had good reasons for doing that. Both these policies, you know, there, there were reasons for doing that. Nobody really wants endless horizontal expansion of cities. However, we haven't really come up with a um, viable alternative. And we're more and more trying to squeeze quartz into pint pots. So when Tony says, why don't we have smaller homes? I would say, well, a home's going to be there for a long time. So you should really get it right in the first place. And rather than looking at a single development site, you should be looking at the city as a whole. And I think we should be looking at building on the green belt, not just smearing housing development over it. And we should also look at public housing again. We don't have to make the mistakes that were made before. Uh, Bob Kerslake was talking about this the other day. Uh, I think we do need to really question the big decisions that have been made 30 years ago, 60 years ago, and revisit them and see if we can do these things differently this time around. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Rowan. I'm just going to start off the discussion and then open out to the audience. So um, do, um, I think there's roving mics. Um, so come and think up your questions right now. Um, Tony, I wanted to start with you. I think you, you were talking about housing is about people, which sounds like a statement of the obvious, until you consider that um, too often communities have got left out of the discussion about what kind of houses they want. Um, do you think that developers have forgotten the people who are going to live in the houses? Well, Barclay's always very clear about this, right? And we've, we've done regeneration probably longer than most of our competitors. But we always start with the people, and we have some very clear policies about this. Once we've won a, a regeneration site and we're starting work, once we have all the bureaucracy out the way and all the plan of emissions, we then go to the stakeholders, and the stakeholders are the residents. And we sit them down, and it's very simple, and it's as plain as this with us, we don't need anybody now. We have all the permissions we want, but let's discuss it. And we were just discussing it just now, and Roland's seen some of our development sites. Kidbrook's the one which was called the Old Farrow Estate. We discussed it, so the social tenants said to us, why have you put the playground in front of our houses? And, you know, we all know the answer to that. So we moved it. So we always engage with all of the stakeholders right throughout the history of the site. And I think where Roland's correct is, and what we've got to do, we've got to build houses that got longevity. I mean, the Farrier Estate was pulled down after 30 years, but it won every award there was. Why was it pulled down? Because nobody respected the people, nobody did the maintenance on it, and it was just allowed to go into degradation. And then they, 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 this awful word that people never use, we, it, it became a sinking estate. So if you lived on the Farrier Estate, you couldn't get a job. So we forget about people. So if you start off on the premises of respecting people, and whether it's the space standards, or the architecture, or the public realm, and we've got six of these sites around London, and I can tell you today that we don't use our customer ratings because they're so, so good, it would be an embarrassment for us. somebody to Twitter me today and say it ain't right. But at the end of the day, it is always about people. It always starts about people. Identify the people's needs and find a solution. So I think that more exemplars around the country that are built by builders that care, and, and, you know, and we care about it and we drive it, is where the answer starts. And, you know, and I agree with you, right? It is not about modern methods of construction. It, it, it's about additionality and affordability. And it's about the politicians standing up and being counted. I mean, you know, we have this debate that goes on about Green Belt. 
I suspect nobody in this audience wants to build on green belt. But, you know, when I was a very young man, which was more years ago than I want to know, there's a site in Raysbury where I started working for a man that run RHT, Ready Mix Concrete. I often quote this. 300 acres lays derelict. It's got barbed wire around it. The public can't use it. The community can't use it. It's of no benefit to anybody. Why can't we put housing on it at the end of the day? And housing that's affordable. It sits in RMC's books or whoever owns RMC today. I think it's Centrica. Right at the end of the day, at probably £10,000 an acre, this is where the politicians have got to stand up and be counted. CPO well, let me, it. Let, let, me, let me put that to you, Rowan. Um, to the two points there that came out of that. The politicians, there's not the political will. Um, how, does that, how do you change that? And that point about the green belt, just if you would expand on what you think of that. Um, yeah, it's massively about leadership um, because it does mean taking unpopular decisions. Uh, it also means being serious about actually doing a good job with, with whatever is, is built and planned. Um, but if you can do HS2 and you can annoy a lot of people by building HS2 and spend a lot of public money on it, then I don't see why that can't, kind of will can't go into housing in principle. Um, and well, there's a lot of conservative voters who wouldn't yes. want the green belt built on, for example. Well, yeah, and I think, you, okay, you have to respect, you know, anybody, you know, you have to respect NIMBYs, you know, NIMBYs are not idiots, they're not bad people, they're just defending their own interests. Um, whatever you build anywhere, you're going to encounter that, but it does require, so it requires an understanding of that and how can you make it good for everyone, and it does also require political will and, and a big picture. Um, in terms of you know, how this is really going to happen, it is going to take a really long time. I mean, something I found through writing my book was that it takes a really long time to turn things around. For 20 years, everyone knew in the 19th century that the Thames was full of sewage and that was unacceptable. And it was 20 years before anyone even started to do anything about it, even though it was blindingly obvious. I think we're kind of getting to that point now. And I think there will be a sort of more and more of a popular feeling that something's got to budge, something's got to shift. David, the government has done quite a lot on, on planning rules, for example, but are you finding still that that's a problem for you? Planning's a real challenge in terms of the nimbyism. Um, mm. I think we are too open to too many views in this country. I think we should make some good, strong decisions and follow through on them. Um, I think Tony ourselves do regeneration areas, so it's about creating a vision about what's going to come so when we get the challenges that people are talking around, we do address it up front. I think planning could become a lot more tuned into where society is at, because I think they know the theory, and they know, they know what should work in theory, but then in the real world, you know, reality is if Tony's got 150 million locked up in the design, if I have to put a lot of infrastructure in with no return, then we've got to work together to, to find the solution. So I do think the planners need to switch on to where society's moving, the pace of change, and some of the policies the government's coming out with. So, and I think the government's got to show leadership about driving through some of the change, rather than just announcing change. There's a, there's a distinct difference between how they do that. Well, let's open out to um, the audience now. Um, I, I'm pretty sure there's roving mics. There's lots of hands going up anyway. Yeah, there's a mic just here. If we could come round to the front here, that would be great. There's quite a few hands just here and here. Uh, and if you could say, just right at the front here, please. Um, if you could say who you are, where you're from, that'd be great. Just white shirt at the front here, please, for the mic. Great, thank you. Thanks. Um, my name is Robin Henschel, Henschel Capital, uh, finance guy. Um, question primarily for uh, Dave and Tony about social housing, um, and it's a three-parter. I wondered if you have, yeah, sorry, uh, if, you, if you have a rule of thumb for the cost of all in cost of social housing build, uh, excluding the land, so I know that varies so much. Um, the second, what you think that needs to be, that cost, I'm assuming it's above where it needs to be at the moment to get build done. And then the third part, how, how we're going to get there, what has to change to get costs down to where it needs to be. Tony, you wanna start off? share your costs first? <laughs> Thank you. Um, look, I don't call it social housing. I think it's the wrong name. 
I like to call it affordable housing. I think it's a big challenge for us. I mean, you know, depending on the political colour of the boroughs in which we operate and some of the shahs in which we operate, some of them don't want affordable housing at all, which is a debate we haven't had. But I mean, in the round, give or take £20 a square foot, to build affordable houses a day to the London Design Guides and standards we need is £200 a foot, would be our view. It drops dramatically as you go outside London. It will drop to £250, £160 a foot. So that's where it is. How do we get to affordable? I've always had a simple view as a developer. The day that the government stands up and sets the level, the developers will adjust to it. It's as simple as that. So if they put it on us at 30% is where I think it should be in a balanced community and make it part of a balanced community. And they said, that's it. That's what we're going to have. The land values will come down, which we haven't talked about today because land values have just gone crazy in the last five years. You know, we pay our tax on it, but it's making houses not affordable. So I'd set it at 30% would be my big thing about where you want to go. And I'd fix it, and a lot of people will disagree with me about that. But that's at least 30% of it is going back to the community at affordable prices. And I would fix the rent in context of that, and I'd cross subsidy it across, which is what we've all grown up doing for years. David? Yeah, um, two, two very distinct markets, northern market, southern market. We're building for £150 a foot in Cambridge. We're building for £90 a foot in Middlesbrough, just, just to give some idea of the spread of cost. How do you make it affordable? I think I said when I was introduced at the lectern, the government's got to do some intervention because we just cannot build to affordable rents, social rents, um, levels within the M25. The viability of the land, the cost of materials, the cost of labour, which is rising by the week, um, and unless there's some intervention about wanting a genuine affordable home, it ain't going to happen. And we were talking about starter homes upstairs as a replacement for social rent. Well, again, that's a challenge in, in that how does it work? You're going to devalue the market, you're going to have two tier home buyers, you're going to have an awful lot of challenge around the starter home initiative, and it gets even worse the further north you go. So it's, it's, there's a lot of challenges in your question around the need for social rent, what's affordable, what's genuinely affordable. Uh, and if we had the answer, then I think we'd all be very clever people, I think. I'd have one other point yeah, on that sure. too. I'd link the affordable rent back to the average, the average wages of the area so that we've got the rules absolutely clear. And then I'd leave the industry to deal with it. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm brilliant. I completely agree with you about uh, having a really clear rule. The way everything is endlessly negotiated, um, lots of consultants get in on the act, Sorry, some of you are probably here. Um, <laughs> viability s s assessments, etc. Uh, to have a really clear rule that everybody knows what it is and the cost of it comes out of the land value seems much, much better. What about this idea of um, letting residents bring down the price by letting residents finish off their own home, whether it's you know furnishings or um, the painting or whatever, is that a bit of a swizz or is that a good idea? Yeah, I think it is a bit of a swizz because you're not really taking a cost out of the out of the product because in fact people like Tony are probably better at building a kitchen cost effectively than somebody doing it at the weekends and you still need a kitchen so you still have to spend that money somehow. But, I mean if it's just a question of decorating or something is that okay? Does it really nah. reduce the price much? Look, you know one of my biggest challenges in my private life is my friends who can't get a decorator. <laughs> I mean, it sums it up. So leave the professionals. That's not the challenge today. I would still take you back to the, the audience. How do we get the additionality and the affordability into this to make the housing market work? Great. There was another question. Second row, I think it is. Great. Thank you. Right. Yeah, thank you very much. Much better. Um, hello, my name's Jane Brigginshaw from the Homes and Communities Agency. Um, it's really a question for David. Um, we hear a lot about, uh, is London going to lead us out of the crisis? Uh, and here we are in the southeast. You've mentioned um, that there might be another way. And I'd be really interested in your thoughts on whether that is the case. Um, I spend a lot of time in Manchester, Leeds, Newcastle, Derby, Nottingham. There's a lot of activity going on there. But I absolutely appreciate the type of values that you're talking about. Yet with the devolution of agenda, is there room for hope that we might have somewhere else leading us out of the crisis? Is infrastructure likely to 
play a meaningful part in it. It, it clearly does. Um, the, the, the cities that you mentioned were very strong and active in, and were strong partners to here too, as you probably were in them cities. And what, what, what's clear in them cities is clear vision about where they want to be, where they want to put the units, the style of units they want to build. But also, I think there's a, a realism around how the valuation process works in terms of what we can sell for against what we can build for and how you take that slice in the middle. Now, in the southeast, I think I'm fairly, a lot of conversations, a lot of chief execs of local authorities, with their challenge is how do you replicate what works in the north, in the, in the south? And it's clearly looking at the brownfield, it's clearly looking at distressed estates, it's clearly looking at, at the blue collar employment skills, the outer London boroughs, your Hounslow's, your Hillingdon's, your, your sort of Barnet's, your Barkins, where there is brownfield land available. The infrastructure is generally in there around the sort of transport networks and the access into London. And it's thinking a different way around, you know, what's the output require and then what's the journey to that output rather than you know, come up with a solution. So if we say we want a destination in Hounslow, near the airport, near the M4, A4, good transport network links, but there's some real good brownfield land there that if they just opened it up and said, we're gonna make a destination community, some of the issues that Tony's talked around, and design around the output, and then let industry get on with it rather than policy on policy on policy, we can come up with solutions that work. If there's parameters are set there, it's going to be affordable, there's going to be so much design-led issues, and, and, and we work around them, them sorts of, but the likes of Manchester have got a real good devolution agenda, and they're really focused on the outputs, whereas London, you're dealing with the GLA, then 33 independent local boroughs, and it's, it's a real, for a new player in that sector in London, we're finding it, it's, it's a difficult landscape to work our way around. A uh, question here, please, thanks. Oh, yeah. um, my name is Bethany Wild. I'm a building inspector. Um, do you think that the rush to build all the new homes has directly affected the quality of the construction of the new builds? Not the finishes, not you know the, the kitchens, etc., but the actual construction? Tony. I, look, you're asking the wrong person about that. We have quality control and checks in Barclay. We've been established many years, and, and, and I still see all of our sites, certainly once a month. We've got 100 sites and I see them. Our quality sits at the top of it. It's somebody's own, our own culture of where we believe. No, I don't. If there's one thing I do believe in, I can't deal with all the odd small builders or large builders that misbehave, but by and large, I think the industry's moved on in the last 10 years. I mean, it's always worrying. Trades are difficult. We, the industry doesn't put enough into apprenticeships. At the end of the day, and we don't spend enough time in it. But, but you know, the, I'm not talking about the finishes. The base quality has to be there. And, you know, building inspectors like yourself make sure it's there. The NHBC stepped up their game. So I, I don't think we got a, a, a building problem. And, and, and it's very simple again. Stand by your product. Barclays famous, it will stand up. It has a no quibble policy, and it stands by its product. And that goes right through our culture. So if you let a letter of complaint get on my desk, I will go and see the purchaser, and I will deal with it as I see on that day. And if that affects your bonus, if we're gonna go to the art of this, it will affect your bonus if you're one of my managing directors, and that keeps the culture right. Just Definitely. out of interest, um, how reliant are you on Eastern European labor? Um, how reliant on British, native I, British labor? I thought it was going too well. <laughs> I you mean, can look, see there's uh, an EU uh, referendum question just lurking on the oh, okay, I thought it would be coming. Uh, look, it, 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 look, I'm very British, and I, and I believe in Britain, and, and I want to buy British. But it's not easy for us. We can't buy British at times. But to answer your question, 50% of my workforce, and we have 14,000 subbies working for us out there today, is from that part of Europe. So when it comes to uh, Brexit, it would would be that a, make a, a big difference oh, to you? If that labour force went home, it would make a massive difference. But you're out of business. It is, we have contingency thing, but it are about production. I'm glad you have a contingency, because apparently the Treasury doesn't. But um, anyway, <laughs> um, uh, Rowan, I mean, obviously Tony here is a paragon of virtue, he says. Mm -hmm. um, what about other, I have to leave it up to you to sort of name and shame other developers um, who might not be Can, can I first authority. ask the question of what do you think? 
Have we got Sorry, a mic? I've lost Do we the have mic. a mic? Yeah, Sorry. great. Thank you. I, I think it has gone down personally. It's going down. Yeah. Okay. Because um, people are more focused on just completing the plots and getting the figures than yeah. actually focusing on the quality of it. They're just throwing them up. Uh, yeah, I mean, that would be my perception with in a lot of cases. I mean, I actually think the, the very worst thing about what's happening now is less to do with the design of individual buildings, although that's often not fantastic, but what the totality of these buildings are. Because a home is not just a unit, it's part of a neighborhood. Um, when you have something like Kidbrook, where, where Tony is doing the whole lot, um, you tend to get more cohesion, better relationships to the outdoor spaces and so on. When you have like an area like I recently wrote about a little project in Shepherdess Walk in Islington, which in itself was nice. But all around there, there's stuff going up um, and nothing relates to anything else. There's no consideration of what kind of spaces are being made. Um, there's no, no coordination. And that makes a huge difference to what what it's like to live in in your home and it should be better for everything everyone to get those things right because if you've got a great park outside your house you don't need a garden which or you have less a different need for a garden which you know makes higher density more viable so you know it's really just common sense but because of a, the way the planning system and a lot of developers work together we're not really seeing it i mean i saw um, you know, at Vauxhall Nine Elms, there's all this development going on. There's some kind of framework. There's a bloody hideous road going through it, which they're doing nothing about. And so you see these blocks going up. They've got balconies on the outside because that's what they've got to do because of the London Design Guide. At the lower levels, they've wrapped the, the balconies in glass, obviously because there's a hideous road. And you think, well, if you sorted out the road, you wouldn't have to wrap the balconies in, in glass. You know, it's that kind of thinking that, that we're lacking. David, people are just throwing these things up, according to our questioner here. I mean, as speed with any industry, there's bound to be some quality issues that come through. And I think, you know, we would be virtuous like Tony about the quality controls we've got in place. Um, but things do occur. And if you've got 3% defects on 1,000 units, that's 300 units. You've got 3% de defects on 100 units, that's three units. So the more volume there is, the more it's going to be apparent there are some some inherent sort of faults, but we try and work them through. Some of the answers in this, this sort of whole exhibition about modern methods of construction, new products, and as we develop our systems, you know, that will design out some of the faults. For my sins, I worked on the last no finds in this country, so the rush to system build brings its own problems. So keep what's in two parts of the business, one's a refurb business, one's a new built for homes business, and we've made out a living putting right the sins of the past in terms of the refurb business. So we've got to be very careful at this dash to offsite and sort of system build. But by the same token, we've got to put more quality and controls in place. And, and maybe, you know, t speed and quality, we've got to just maybe put things into balance and listen to what the industry's saying. Um, there's a question over here, which, because I've got x-ray vision, I can see through the podium. Uh, thank you. Uh, Sean Curtin, I'm a residential surveyor, mainly in uh, West London. Um, my question is about um, rent controls. Uh, Tony um, gave a positive view towards those. Uh, cities like New York have them. I noticed through my work and also through my activity through a group called London Citizens, which campaigns for housing for uh, people in the social sector, that rents have got so astronomically high that many people, particularly single parents, are finding it very difficult to struggle to live in London. So with the mayoral election coming up, rent controls may, in specific areas, be introduced. I just wonder what the panel's views are on it. And one other point, I lived in Japan from 1992 to 2003, and if you live in a mega city like Tokyo, you will understand the importance of a green belt, because if you don't have green, you just have nothing but mega city expansion. So I would suggest that each of the panel go and live in somewhere like uh, Tokyo for a year and you think you'll understand the importance of them. Thank you. Tony, rent controls. I've been to Tokyo and I agree with you. A bit, but we're not talking about attacking what we call green belt that a community can use. And you know, all of our big regenerations got big parks on them 40% normally. So, and we normally double it against what it was. 
I don't, I'm not an advocate of rent control, but I'm an advocate of something else. You go right back to where I started. We're going to have 30% affordable. The, the, the rent should be controlled by definition of linking it to the salary. And that way, that's, that's the part that the community's giving back. And, and that should deal with it, is my view. And you should have product that goes right across the range, something for everybody in that 30%. And most of the bigger states that we do around London have somewhere between 30 and 35% affordable, and it seems key. And, and if you go to a lot of the London boroughs that we talk to, right? I was in one yesterday. They have 72% that's social. It's too much, it's not a balance. Greenwich was 70% when we first arrived. Chris Roberts, who's, who's a social leader, who's a first class man, he did not want 70%, he wanted balance. But to answer your question, it should come out of the 30% and it should be linked to salaries because then it's affordable and it deals with it in a simple rule. Rowan, rent controls the answer. Um, can I just come back on the green belt point? I mean, I totally agree with you, but okay, firstly, we're not talking, nobody is talking about building on the whole green belt. The green belt is absolutely enormous. Secondly, the green belt is not really doing its job of raising the quality of life of Londoners, which it was invented for because most Londoners don't go to the green belt most of the time. And what's happening is the quality of the spaces in London, the quality of the places where people live, are being squeezed because of the pressure, partly because of the pressure created by the green belt. So I totally agree with you. We need green space, but um, I don't think the green belt, just saying you can't touch the green belt is the way to achieve that. Um, Rent controls, I'll leave that to, to the experts. Oh, come on, <laughs> no, come on. The observer um, has to have a view on rent control. Um, yeah, I think you have to have, in any city, you have to have uh, housing that is accessible to people who can't or don't want to buy. Uh, and the whole direction of government policy at the moment is saying everybody wants to buy. Um, I think that's wrong. Some people want to rent. Some people have to rent. Uh, I think one of the reasons people do want to buy so much is because the rental option is so appalling, both in terms of cost and quality. If, if there were better rental options, public and private, people wouldn't want to own so much. Um, we've probably got time for one more question. I know I've favoured the front because I can't see to the back. If you're wild about asking a question, no, there's a sort of apathy towards the back. So at the front here, please. Thank you. Just here. Thank you. Um, I'm Steve Thomas. I work for Barclay Home Central London. Um, I just wondered how important you see the role of the smaller and medium-sized developers in contributing to the housing crisis, um, and if there are any additional barriers uh, that they may face when competing with obviously the bigger companies. I think it's hugely important to give the diversity of, of, of stock. I think a lot of the Bartley Homes came, most came from being small builders, so I think for the sustainability of the industry it's really important that we encourage small builders. The barriers to entry, particularly around public land, is the whole procurement process. Uh, we employ an army of people to deal with the procurement process, whether it be local authority or HCA. So there are natural barriers in terms of skill set. You've got to be able to evidence all sorts of policies which um, to get you onto the list. So there's a whole bureaucracy about the small medium enterprises being able to build. I think the other challenge is, is around resources. Um, we can pre-buy bricks, we can pre-buy trusses, based on volumes. Uh, some of them small builders in terms of cost of audibility don't have that accessibility. And I think it's incumbent on the industry, and I look myself at Tony as leaders, to actually encourage small, small enterprises to come through because they'd rather be our supply chain or our successes. So I passionately believe that we do need to make room for the small builders to build some more of the homes that, 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 that this country demands and needs. Tony? I've always been an advocate of small builders and, and again I'd go right back, look I mentor a number of small builders, I see them, I try and help them, I feel sorry for them, they haven't got a chance really, unless they've got some family wealth they can't enter the business so you make giants like us even more powerful, right, and I again go right back to the politicians, I wish they'd come and sit in the audience today and debate it with ordinary people. When it costs you three quarter of a million pound to promote a plan of mission, how do you ever get an SME in there? 
you know, I mean, I'm president of the London Chamber of Commerce and I spend my life pro promoting this and we've just written on it. But can we get government to listen? No. It's antidotal, it's everything but deal with it. So, I mean, you know, when I started, I built the first house. I scribbled it on the back of a piece of paper. Go and see the planning officer, have a chat to him. He said, you can't put that there, Tony, because it's too close to that one. If you do that and that with it, six weeks later, I got a permission. The average permission today, with all the might we have, is over 12 months, and in many cases, two years. We've just bought self all gas works. Well, I say just. Two years ago, the mayor called it in, gave it planning. I thought it was a great site with Crossrail there. I haven't laid a brick. Bureaucracy. I'm still clearing the conditions, and I'm supposed to be an expert two years on, and we're supposed to have a housing crisis. So I support MSEs and anything we can all do in the industry to do to get those small owner drivers into it. They're part of the community. They do do a better job. They won't worry that young lady with the building rigs and that. that so they'll be there on site. They're a good thing, and we should encourage more of it. On that note of consensus, I'm going to draw things to a close. Thank you very much to all our speakers. That was really thought-provoking. And thank, thank you, you, the audience, for listening and for some excellent questions. Thank you. Thank you.